Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Bird. Uh, thank you, Smith and Nephew, and of course, thank you, Dr. Phil Pond, for the opportunity to be here today. I'm going to speak about allograft label reconstruction of the hip. Uh, my disclosures have no bearing on the content of this talk. Uh, everyone asked me sort of in between uh, the conference, uh, what are my indications for labor reconstruction? Well, certainly and absolutely revision hip arthroscopy. Uh, and then also when the labrum is irreparable. Now, admittedly for me over the last several years, the spectrum for what I consider repairable has grown very small. And my threshold to reconstruction, uh, uh, to perform a reconstruction, I should say, uh, has become very small as well. So great to start out with a case. Uh, uh, this is a situation where we have a 48-year-old male. You can see he has an area of uh, cephalad, um, an area of cephalad retroversion at the top of the cup, and you can see a pretty severe cam. And then you see a labrum that's about two to three times the normal size, at least two times the normal size, and very degenerative. Uh, overall, very healthy joint. Uh, and so I guess the question is. You know, what would you do if this is your case? Uh, would you repair this? Would you debreed this? Would you feel bad that you're in here, that maybe this case isn't going to go that well? Uh, or would you do a labor reconstruction? And so I think when you look at our natural orthopedic evolution and other joints, um, it typically has started with a debridement or a discovery as to what the pain generator is. And then it typically moves towards a repair. And then ultimately we find some of the tissue that we try and repair maybe doesn't stabilize or heal as well as we would like. And then we look into reconstructive techniques. And I don't think that the hip should be any different. If you really think hard about this, if you think about the rest of the body, we really don't repair anything, um, any ligament or meniscal structure in the body when it's chronically torn. And I think all of our labral tears are chronic injuries. And usually when we see them, sometimes they're acute on chronic. But for the most part, it's been brewing for a long period of time. So I don't think the tissue is that inherently healthy. I think that the labral reconstruction offers an ideal solution for us moving forward. The reason being is we remove the painful labral tissue. I think we all agree that the major pain generator within the joint is the torn labrum. The graft material should always be a neural. We see this with ACL reconstructions. They do not regain proprioceptive qualities. Uh, even though the ACL surgeon would love to have that happen, we've not been able to make that happen. In the labral reconstruction, we exploit this. Uh, because in this situation, we don't want the labrum to feel anything. We want it to be callous and insensitive and do its job and not complain. We've evolved to the point where our graph length now is 10 and a half to 13 and a half centimeters, finding better results with longer graphs. And so I think now we're able to reproduce normal anatomy with this technique. When you think about it, total hip replacement, I don't know how many of you still do this. I do total hips. They do wonderfully. They're very fun to take care of because patients, remarkably, always do well. And the reason being is because I don't think it really matters what hip you bring to the table. Okay? In both of these situations, these are very different hips. but the total hip replacement standardizes the procedure and gets a very nice result. For hip arthroscopy, however, I think these are examples of patients that I saw in the last year. And when you take a look at this, these are all right hips. Every single one of these labrums is very, very, very different. And I think that we all, when we get into the hip arthroscopy, we get our portals, we take a look, and a lot of us just kind of get this bad feeling. Mm, I just don't think this patient is going to do that well, and it's because of the tissue that we inherited. And I think the problem with this is it doesn't matter how you repair any of these tissues, except for maybe this one, okay? Whether it's a loop, whether it's through, whether it's like George does it or Joe does it, it doesn't really matter. It's all going to come back to your basic tissue from the beginning. And I think the labor reconstruction offers an opportunity as for us to standardize our hip arthroscopy procedure. And to kind of tag on to Dr. Von Thiel's talk, I think that it offers us an opportunity to do well in patients who are old as well. This is our paper, a uh, minimum of two-year follow-up. Uh, it was published uh, this time last year in arthroscopy. Uh, we had 114 hips, 107 patients. Our average patient age was 39 years old. So admittedly, this is in getting close to that older cohort, uh, and even up to age 57. Uh, one third of the patients, 32 uh, percent, were revision procedures. And despite all of this, we had a very nice hair SIP score improvement of 34. And I keep an eye on the literature. I really don't see many labor repair studies uh, for hair SIP score improvement uh, breach the 24 mark. So I think that this shows the potential of this. The value of the paper, I think it really does show the power and great potential of this procedure. It is the largest cohort of labral reconstructions. It validates the use of allograft for those that want to use allograft for their labral grafts. Uh, and it's the first description of the front to back technique for labral reconstruction. That basically means we fix the graft from the front to the back, we cut it inside so that we have the perfect graft length every time. 
This is a paper that just uh, was published in December um, of 2016 in arthroscopy. Revision arthroscopic acetabular labral treatment, repair, or reconstruct. Um, uh, in this paper, uh, we had over 100 revisions. I'm going to go into greater detail in the talk I have later this morning. But we had 14 re repairs, 90 reconstructions after final follow up, which is over 90%, a minimum of two years, 50% failure rate with the re repairs, and 12% failure rate with the reconstructions. We concluded from the data that it was 4.1 times more likely to fail with a re-repair than with a reconstruction. So this is very powerful because if you work on revisions, this is a patient that's in a very bad place. And I think that we really have to offer them what is best in that situation to get out of it. We also found uh, we were able to compare some of the earlier reconstructions I did for revisions versus some of the later ones. And we found that the longer non-segmental graphs perform better with a much a uh, higher success rate than our shorter, more segmental graphs. Harris hip score improvement was 32 uh, in the patients that, that succeeded with this. That's a huge improvement for a revision procedure, considerably better than Dr. Larson's paper looking at revision hip arthroscopy, which was a Harris hip score improvement of 14. So I think in revisions, this is definitely the way to go moving forward. Uh, very large cohort for revision hip arthroscopy that shows the value of this. Considerably lower failure rate, again, with reconstructions versus re-repair, 12% versus 50%. And really, I, I think that it nicely objectively validates the use of this procedure for revisions. This is a patient um, that was a labor repair two years ago. She's 22 years old. You can see the tissue that you have to work with in revision situations quite a bit. It's typically injected, uh, inflamed, and pretty gross to work with. This is actually her reconstruction. Okay, so I'm a visual person. I like to look at the pictures and the literature. This to me is very powerful because I, I really believe in that product to get that patient out of her rut paper that we're going to release uh, and, and submit uh, probably in the next couple months, bilateral hip arthroscopy, di direct comparison of primary labral repair and primary labral reconstruction. I always credit Dr. Bird for encouraging me to take a look at this. The surgeries were done on both sides by me. So really, the only variable with the hip arthroscopy was what I did with the labrum. Their deformities were very similar. We have a minimum of two-year follow-up, and we worked very hard to track down all 20 of these, 28 of these patients for 100% follow-up. We found in the study no reconstructions failed. Uh, and nine of the 28 patients, or 32%, came back to me. They had failed their repair and wanted a reconstruction performed to have what they had on the other side. So that, to me, is a very powerful statement. And I think clearly in my practice, the labral reconstruction is performing better. So I think with all of these studies, I think I validated the front to back technique uh, for labral reconstruction, the use of allograft if you choose to use it. I think labral reconstruction should become the standard for revision hip arthroscopy. And labral reconstructions, at least in my hands right now, is performing better than labral repair. So back to this patient, I've removed the labrum. Uh, you can see he has a little cartilage wear on the edge of the cup, but he's got beautiful cartilage on the rest of the cup and a beautiful cartilage on the femoral head. We've taken down the pincer, and we've also reshaped the proximal femur. So the question is, do you leave it as this? Well, we know that the labrum is important for the seal effect to maintain joint fluid within the joint for cartilage nutrition. I think a main contributor to the joint is acetabular volume enhancement, particularly if you have any element of antiversion to the front of the cup, uh, protecting the cartilage from shear forces and joint stability. So we did not do that. We did a labral reconstruction. This is a 12 and a half uh, centimeter labral reconstruction. You can see it went all the way down to the front coming along the back. It goes further down. I just didn't show that in this video for whatever reason. And you can see that we have a perfect seal between the labral reconstruction and femoral head. So we reconstituted normal anatomy from a situation where it was impossible to do so. From the beginning, you can see we've removed the crossover sign here, and we've got a nice femoral osteoplasty or reshaped femoral neck. So the question goes then to you. Which would you rather have if it were you, uh, and which would you rather be able to perform? The technique, two options for labral reconstruction. You can either fix it in the front uh, and then the back and then in between. This is a really nice technique, uh, at least in the beginning for labral reconstruction, because it basically can convert uh, a labral reconstruction to a large labral repair. The disadvantage is as you start getting into larger labral graphs or larger labral defects or um, uh, missing 
labral segments, it's hard to accurately measure the distance on the acetabular rim. And when you fix it front and back in between and it's an eight centimeter graft, if you're too short, it's hard to reduce. If it's too big, it's hard to get a seal. That's why I developed the front to back technique because it made it so that I could, I, I could have a reproducible procedure for whatever I got into. But I think what Dr. Fawcett said is that there's no question this is very technically demanding, but at least when you're done, if you know how to do it properly, you're going to get a reliable product. You have to use three portals, and admittedly, I also use a fourth portal now right below this. The three and four portals are really how I get my anchors. The fourth portal just allows me to get a little bit lower down the back. Um, and really, for my fourth anchor position, which I'll show you later, that really gets a perfect angle. And, and Dr. Boykin really showed a nice example of the advantages of your angles from coming from anterior medial versus your distal portals being convergent uh, 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 into the cup as you use your anterior medial portal for this. Uh, and then basically visualization portals are either your anterior medial or your anterior lateral, depending on whether you're looking to the front or looking to the back. And that's where you, you shuttle your sutures through. You have to be able to place anchors along the entire acetabular rim. Um, uh, you can see this is a right hip. We go all the way down the back now, so it's very comprehensive reconstruction. Every zone has its challenges. Uh, bottom zone down here can be a little bit soft, right by the origin of the anterior transverse acetabular ligament. I call this no man's zone. This is right above the iliopsoas fossa. It gets very thin, so you usually want to put another anchor on the third uh, area right there to avoid that. Uh, and then this area is sometimes where you have a little bit of eversion of the edge of the cup or a thickened cartilage. And so this is a zone where it's very easy to evert your graft. And then down the back is where it gets thin again. The goals of the prepared graft, um, <clears throat> I've witnessed a couple labor reconstructions and also uh, tried to help people with this. I always encourage when people visit to bring their surgical assistant or their PA that's going to help them because the graft really shouldn't be an afterthought. It shouldn't be prepared in two minutes. You need to spend a lot of time to prepare it because the labor reconstruction is so challenging because in ACL reconstruction, you're basically pulling the graft from one side of the joint to the other uh, and then fixing it on either side. The hard part with the labor reconstruction is you have to be able to work with your graft for anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes in an aqueous solution that's tight, and you usually have to touch it with instruments to manipulate it, so it can fray it pretty easily. You have to be very careful with your, with your preparation, uh, and you have to have a really good assistant. And the goal, really, when you think about the graft is you need to have it adequately compressed so that it can incorporate, but then you also want it to have the appropriate size so it'll form a nice seal with a femoral head. And the balance for me between these two is probably five to six millimeters, because when you're really small with the graft, you can get good compression, but it's hard to get the seal. When you have a really big graft, the seal is easy, but compression is challenging, and it takes up a lot of your working space in the joint. So I think that that's probably the best size for me. This is the front to back technique. We've prepared the acetabular rim. We've placed all of our anchors. <clears throat> We've gotten all the way down to the origin of the anterior transverse acetabular ligament. We then pull the graft into the joint. We provisionally position it, and then we fix it. A few anchors in the front. I've now skipped a number of uh, anchors in the middle. I then tension the graft to measure it and then cut it. Then once it's cut, then I place a double loaded suture through the back of the graft to secure the back of the graft. And we use one through suture to prevent my circumferential suture from slipping over the back edge. And this is your final labor reconstruction. The cartilage is stabilized nicely. Nice view down the back of the joint. And then you reduce the joint. And you can see that we've recreated a perfect seal between the labral reconstruction and femoral head. And we've got a nice shape to the femoral osteoplasty as well. OK, so that's a fast video. I like to show everybody now how we do that. Okay, so this is the anterior and inferior acetabular access. This is the key. Okay, you have to keep your capsule intact through here. A lot of people take it out. They think you need to take it out to get to the bottom. You don't want to, because this is a three point. You're coming from skin around the femoral head back into the joint, so you have to have your capsule intact. Don't do a psoas release um, uh, and try and get away from those in general. Uh, and then you want to get your guide all the way down to the bottom, and that's how you get access to the bottom. So you have to keep your capsule intact. You have to keep your capsule intact. Securing the graft. So a lot of people will tie a knot and then push the graft in. I actually just secure the graft to the suture, shorten the post, and then pull up on the post to pull it into the joint. That way you don't get any messy knots inside of your cannula, and you very efficiently can pull the graft into the joint, and then you push it into the joint. 
Okay, so that's a really nice way to get your graft into the joint. The back, how to cut it, uh, challenging, very hard, especially as you start working further and further down the back. The way you do it is you tension it. What you want to do is you want to kind of pull it so it just comes into the joint slightly. Then you switch your instruments. So what I have now is I basically have the cutting instrument coming from my anterior lateral portal, my holding instrument holding tension coming from the distal portal. And what that does is that just kind of holds the rubber band in tension, okay, so that you basically can cut it. Securing the posterior graft. So this is a double loaded suture and you can see what we're doing now is we're passing the suture through the end of the graft. Now this blue tiger is going to be my through suture. It's the most distal, okay? And I'm going to tie that down. You're going to see that's going to secure the graft down nicely. Okay, on the end. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the black tiger and I'm going to wrap it around the graft. But because I have the blue tiger distal to that, it can't cut out. So it's like a Mason Allen construct, okay? And it's really nice now because this is how I'm getting compression of the graft. I'm really not getting that much compression with the through suture because I don't know how much of the graft I've got. It's just holding it in place and preventing the black from cutting out. And you can see we've got a nice graft contour down the back of the joint. Final recommendations. So I, I intentionally want to get people excited about this procedure because I do think that it has incredible merit for the future. But however, you have to have incredible respect for it. I think what Dr. Fawcett said with the wave analogy I think is uh, an incredible analogy because you have to proceed with great respect. You have to realize that what you're doing, is you're doing because you, you, you really don't believe that you can get that tissue to heal with a repair or you're in a revision situation, whatever that situation may be. But this is probably your final hip scope. It's really hard to, to, to improve upon a well done labor reconstruction. And the next surgery very well could be a total hip replacement. You have to absolutely meticulously prepare your graft. You need to have a good assistant. This is not a five-minute graft preparation process. This is 20 to 25 minutes, okay? You have to take the time to get your, pat, your graft perfect. And you also have to work with your assistant. You can't just turn it over to them to figure out, okay, we need a 13-centimeter graft. Go ahead and make it. You want to roll the tissue. You want to figure out exactly what you have, and you want to get it prepared perfectly. FEI work. I think a lot of times people work in the central compartment first and then they go out to the peripheral compartment and the cam osteoplasty or femoral osteoplasty is an afterthought and I think that's a mistake. The machine is why we got to the point where the labrum tore and I think that we really need to get better at FAI work. We really need to spend the time to get it perfect. It's a sculpture. It has to be done well. Anchor position is absolutely critical. Um, you, the, your graft will be centered on the anchor. Your graft will be centered on the anchor. Okay, it's very easy to evert a graft and not create a seal. So you can go through this three hour procedure and you cannot have a seal with your femoral head and then you basically just made yourself feel better by doing a labor reconstruction that's non-functional. So you really want to get your graft in a perfect position. Residual labral tissue I've found has lost its hoop strength and it can be a problem later. I don't think the segmental grafts have worked as well for me, so typically the longer graft and lower graft, especially down the front, or front has worked better. This is a two and a half to three hour, three and a half hour procedure. I've done almost two and a half, almost about 2,000 of these procedures. It's still about the same amount of time. Now it's more efficient, it goes further down the back, we've taken on more complex cases, so I think we have gotten better. But this is not for the person that wants to do this procedure in an hour. You will not have a good result, it will not come out well. It needs to be for the person who's going to devote themselves to this to get this right. If you're interested in coming out uh, to Denver, we'd love to have you. We have training opportunities available through Smith & Nephew. Thank you very much.